Okay, welcome to another episode of the Coach House Podcast. Good evening, Michael. How we doing? Doing well, doing well. We have a um, an interesting guest tonight. I'm going to start this with, um, we're going to talk about urinary incontinence, bowel dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, and pelvic pain, and maybe a little bit more. How yep. do you like that one, huh? It's a little bit different than what we what we typically do, but this yeah, is but... Um, this is uh, this is a good find. Uh, she is a clinical director at the Horsham IV Rehab. Uh, she's been working with uh, with IV, I guess, since 2020. Mm -hmm. She currently specializes in pelvic health rehab for both male and females. And she's completed training through Herman and Wallace, which uh, allows her to treat pelvic floor dysfunction, both internally and externally. And like I said, she's treating uh, conditions like urinary incontinence, bowel dysfunction, prolapse, sexual dysfunction, uh, pelvic pain, and, and, and much more. And um, she's also a, a new mom. So she's out there helping mommies too, I guess. So we can maybe, you know, get a little bit into that. Most of who we, you know, well, we, 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 we feel as though um, we're educating the masses, right, Mike? So we don't know who we're actually hitting here, but who we actually train are, you know, our wheelhouse is probably that 13 to 19 year old female soccer player or female athlete, um, so some of this may pertain to them. And then I'm going to kind of ask some questions that may tie into what we usually talk about, which is ACL rehab and ACL injuries. But um, we would like to introduce Nicole Schneck. Am I pronouncing that correct? Yes. Yes, you are. All right. All right. <laughs> Nicole, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am very excited. I love this topic. I like talking to anybody who will listen to me about the public health. So I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> I, I have to be honest about this. Uh, I don't know. I'll take this back. I know a little bit about this because full disclosure, my older son was having some issues um, a couple of years back. And I was talking to Mike about it and we were, I think we were trying to align him maybe with you or whatever. Yeah. Uh, from it's, from what I understand, it doesn't seem as though he's having any issues, but that doesn't mean they can't be underlying at some point, right? Or yeah. kind of rear its head again. So again, in the intro, we talked about this could be male or female. So when you start mm -hmm. to think pelvic floor training and things like that, automatically your, your head goes, Pelvic, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking female, right? I'm yeah. thinking like right, this has nothing to do with males, you know. And then when Mike honestly, when he brought it to me, I was like, I don't know where it fits in, but honestly, what we're trying to do is make a lot of things fit in and make a lot of things make sense because it could be something from the body, from the pelvis that's that's maybe you know, uh, a, a red flag that we're missing and then it kind of, you know, turns into something like an ACO or an ankle sprain or something yeah. like that. So, um, yeah, sure. yeah kind of tell us a little bit about your background and how you got yeah. to doing what you're doing. So, um, for me, I didn't know I wanted to do PT when I was in high school. I just knew I liked science. And so I went to undergrad studying biology and I was kind of all over the place, not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and then I was fortunate to be able to go on a medical missions trip to the Dominican Republic, where I worked with multiple doctors, nurses, I think there was a dentist, an eye doctor, all different variety of medical professionals there. And we got to work with different villages that weren't getting medical care. And I think that opened up my eyes to like, okay, there's a lot you can do in the health field to help people. Um, so I started diving into what, where do I want to go? There's so many different ways you can go in the health field. Um, and I was like, well, I, I mean, I used to play sports. I've been to PT. Maybe I'll look into this. Um, and I had a family friend who was a therapist. So she let me shadow her for a little bit. And that kind of like was like, OK, I like this. Let me pursue this. So that led me to Drexel for my graduate schooling. Um, and that's where I got my doctorate in physical therapy. And then right out of schooling, I started working for Ivy Rehab. I was actually in New Jersey at the time and just doing like general adults, outpatient mm -hmm. orthopedics. Um, and 
for the pelvic health component, my boss came to me at one point and was like, hey, would you be interested in this? Like, there's a need. I think you would be good at it. I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> it sounds awful. <laughs> I'm like, no, thank you. Like, I don't want anything to do with this. I like my uh, orthopedics. Like, I want to stay in my lane. <laughs> But as I started treating more, I started realizing there was a lot of people that I couldn't fully help. And that's mm. kind of when my mindset started to change. So it started with, you know, I had some women that I was treating with like back pain. And then, you know, you're treating them for a while. They're getting a little better. But then they start saying things like, oh, like I'm leaking when I try to do a squat. Mm. Oh, OK, well, I don't know how to help that, but <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do. And then I think one of the main turning points for me was I had a patient come who was pregnant and her doctor was like, it literally said on the script, like teach Kegels. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to hear about it. (laughs) Everyone hears about it. But how do you tell someone to do that? (laughs) So that's when I was like, okay, I'll take the first course, kind of see what it's like, dip my finger in it a little bit and take it from there. And I took the first course, fell in love with the material, realized how many people you could help, and then went all the way through the Herman and Wallace training. And that allows me now to treat males as well, which has been like a really fun, cool experience. So So part of that, part of that, (laughs) uh, that certification with Herman and Wallace is that there's a male end to that. Is that? Yeah. So there's like different, so there's like four main courses you can take through Herman Mm -hmm. Wallace. um, And they each like focus on different areas so like the first course is like general and it's all like it's pretty much female um and then I think it's like the second course you get into like more of like you know rectal things which you can apply to the male population so by the end you get a little bit of everything all right yeah 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 see this why this is a good topic because you know someone coming in with back pain you know and then they have some of these other issues I'm thinking about, you know, how many women are going to feel comfortable telling a male therapist this. Um, so I obviously I think it's a great balance to have male and female therapists in the clinic just for that reason. Yep. I mean, we work with a lot of females. Um, but again, you know, it, it is hard. There are some things that are just not going to feel comfortable or embarrassed to talk about. And these could be underlying things that they're struggling with and we just don't know. It could be performance limiting sometimes maybe they're limiting what they're doing in the clinic for fear of something else happening and we don't know we think maybe they're just not motivated or focused you know and these are those underlying things that if we could pick up on maybe some signs or symptoms or something like that we can maybe have a conversation if it's not with the actual you know if it's like a teenager or something we can talk to the parents say hey i'm noticing Mm -hmm. these things you know is she saying anything else to you at home maybe we could refer out something like that um But yeah, I mean, that just kind of got me thinking about, you know, how many people are dealing with stuff and not saying anything. And then, you know, other males that are dealing with something, definitely not saying anything, you know, because of just embarrassment. I would say a lot of patients are dealing with these things and aren't saying anything. And even, you know, with me, with some of my females, it takes them a while sometimes to open up. You know, one of the nice things about our profession is we get to see people often Mm -hmm. and you build a relationship with them. So over time, you get to like, hear a little bit more and they get more comfortable and sometimes it takes a few visits for people to open up about some of these things but yes I agree there's a lot of people that are dealing with this and aren't saying anything because they're embarrassed there's a lot of taboo around it so so without without obviously using any names give me a um a scenario of a male coming in that has an issue and what why does he think that that you're going to help him with this? Like a specific pelvic floor patient? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a case study. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, most of my males are either incontinence or pain. So um, recently I've been treating a good chunk of males that have pelvic pain. So like, for example, one patient came in and he had been riding the Peloton bike. He had just added it into his exercise routine. He had done it um, a couple days in a row and started having a lot of pain along his groin and penis. And then um, it didn't get better. He rested and it just got worse. And then it started interfering with his intercourse. So he decided to ask his doctor about it. Mm. And his doctor, um, I believe his primary care referred him to a urologist because they always want to check like the bladder and all of that. Um, They did tests. Everything was coming back normal. 
So he was just lucky and had a doctor who knew about pelvic health and was like, you should seek this out and see if it can help you. So he ended up coming to me and our plan of care was a lot of stretching and breathing and learning how to relax the pelvic floor because he was super tight. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And that, and that, and that came through him riding the bike. I mean, obviously without getting down the rabbit hole, cause we don't mm -hmm. necessarily know, but him riding the bike and maybe just being tense and just kind of bearing down too much could have been causing him to be tight. So by you stretching and releasing him, allow the pelvic floor or the, or the pelvis more mobility. Yeah. And I mean, it, like anything we treat, it's so important to look at more than just the main thing you're treating. So yeah. especially in pelvic health, you know, we look at all up and down the chain. Um, so for him, he had a lot of deficits through his lumbar spine. His hips were super tight. Um, it was that whole like pelvic complex wasn't moving like it should. It was literally me teaching him pelvic tilts for several visits in a row. <laughs> <laughs> just to get him to move a little bit better. And then another huge component of pelvic health is just like education, education about um, healthy bowel habits. So things like using a stool, um, doing some deep breathing, uh, not sitting there for over 10 minutes, not being on your phone, things like mm. that to reduce like some of the strain along the pelvic floor. Um, so that's a huge You're saying use a stool. Is that where you, you, you're kind of putting your feet up your feet? on a stool? Mm -hmm. Interesting. And yeah. that and without being super, super great. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Who cares? This is our, our podcast, right? Squatty potty. That's right. Squatty okay. potty. Yes. They're yeah. actually very good for you. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. Wh why is that? Because your knees are kind of up a little higher. It's just yeah. the way that you're. Your, it your changes spine the angle of the muscle that's around your rectum so the stool can come out easier. Interesting. So that's why like a lot, like one of the big things with females, a lot of times we like squat over public toilets because no one wants to touch that, mm -hmm. but it's really bad for your pelvic floor because you end up tensing everything. So like yeah. sometimes it's just me like talking to females like, okay, like let's figure out another way <laughs> go to the bathroom in yeah. a public bathroom. <laughs> yeah. We have to do our nesting. Yeah. Nesting. <laughs> sometimes that's not even enough. Yeah. But, yeah. But that's, a, that's, that's a tough one. That's a yeah. tough one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've heard about this with the exercise. Um, you know, individuals getting into high intensity workouts, you know, it was big, like mm -hmm. when P90X was really popular. Mm -hmm. And now you have all these other type of like high intensity workouts, people are getting involved in that. And then obviously with CrossFit, a lot of, uh, you'd see that, you know, they would go from not being very active to all of a sudden this high intensity strain. A lot of those movements are very demanding. So we're not breathing right, you know, and then they start creating this, this, this intense uh, strain. And then, you know, there's other things that come with the culture of some of that type of, of fitness. It's just, you know, the pre-workouts, you know, um, just the competitiveness. So there's a lot of that almost like stress. And so I've heard of situations where some of that was happening because of just this like new type of culture and demand on the body. Then all of a sudden there were some issues that I've heard that on other podcasts with other athletes talking, mm -hmm. especially with things like doing um, Olympic lifts or box jumps, mm -hmm. things like that. And then that happening. And, uh, them thinking, you know, I, mean, I know this is not normal, but like, what do I do about this? You know? So I think, um, you know, a good thing to kind of get into is, you know, if we're looking at individuals, what, you know, what could be some like signs or symptoms or maybe some things that we would like kind of look at if we would start from maybe teenage, you know, teenagers, you know, maybe something there, some type of things you might see, and then maybe going into, you know, adult and then like older, because there's obviously different things that mm -hmm. happen about people's yeah. lifestyles you know obviously for females you know if it's teenager most likely they're probably not having kids but then you know <laughs> obviously into you know then the mom mom age you know in there any from like you know late 20s to 40s you know mm -hmm. and then looking at you know elderly you know mm -hmm. and just seeing like how you know other certain type of lifestyle things or certain activities they're doing and maybe signs of symptoms where they might present differently or the same mm -hmm. you know if we kind of walk through that that'd be kind of cool yeah yeah, sounds good. Um, so if we're starting with our younger population, um, I think it's important. So like I said, with pelvic health, you're always looking at the whole body. So someone's coming to you with back pain, hip pain, whatever, knee pain, whatever it is, you want to make sure you're looking up and down the chain just to see how their movements are. A lot of times when someone's not coming to me directly for pelvic health, when I start to realize there's some pelvic concerns, it's one of those 
it, with all populations, it's something that their pain isn't fully getting better. So that's usually one of the signs. So, you know, you're doing your typical, you know, stretching for the back core exercises, and they're still saying there's discomfort present. Mm -hmm. I think with any population, it's really important that you start asking the questions to dive in on what, when their pain is happening. Um, like you had mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes there might not be that comfort level to give up everything and say everything, but it's okay to also ask like things like, Hey, like, are you having any discomfort when you have a bowel movement or when you urinate? Is there any pain happening? That's one of the huge signs with any population when they're like, actually, yeah, like I, I can't have a bowel movement or my pain gets so much worse when I try to have one. <laughs> um, that's a question that's not as invasive as asking something about like sexual intercourse or something right. that's a little bit more, um, you personal. know, yeah, personal. Mm -hmm. um, so with any population, it's important to ask some of those questions. Um, with our like younger girls, I think it's super important to have a conversation with their parents about birth control. Um, it's a huge thing. A lot of girls, I, a lot of my pelvic pain patients that are young and in their twenties are girls that have been on birth control for a while. And it's made a lot of changes with their hormones. What type um, of birth control? Now there's like so many different Pipes. There's so many different, um, honestly, there are not many great ones. <laughs> They're all have different hormones and different mm -hmm. levels. And even some of the smaller doses I've had patients on and it's messed with some of their levels. Yeah. Um, this is all like subjective from me. I don't know any of the research on it, but just a lot of my younger patients that I do see are patients that have been on different types of birth control. It's been younger, even if they're not on birth control, if you think about, you know, your young high school athlete, she, him or her, they're going through so many hormonal changes. Mm. Um, the menstrual cycle is huge. So that's coming on around that time. Um, and changes in hormones can create a lot of different dysfunction. Um, it can create tightness, it can create pain, and it might present as, okay, I have low back pain or my hips really bothering me, or that's might be what they're telling us because it's easier to say that than, Hey, like my vagina hurts. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. So um, what would you see if, if, you know, um, you know, that it's kind of a pelvic floor to say, it's not like a tight muscle or an imbalance in the back, like would you do those interventions and the same patterns are happening no matter what, no relief, any of that type of stuff, you know, is that what you would see, you know? So a lot of times when someone has pelvic floor dysfunction, there's dysfunction in other areas. So if you're treating the other areas, it's going to make a difference to some regard, um, but it's not going to change everything. So it's hard to like, as you're working with someone to be like, oh, like this is definitely like their pelvic floor. Like I said, a lot of times if someone's not coming to me directly, I'm always kind of giving them a little bit of pelvic floor exercise, but I'm also just looking to see like, okay, like I'm treating their back and this isn't enough. They're still reporting pain. Like, let me start asking questions to dive a little bit deeper to see if there's something else. Um, a lot of my pelvic pain patients, which is a lot of like my younger patients, um, a lot of them have pain with, um, sorry, I like lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, a lot of my younger patients that have pain, their whole pelvic complex isn't moving like it should. So mm -hmm. like they have, you know, like they'll do something like a pelvic tilt and be like, yeah, like that does not feel good. And then you're like, okay. Sure. And then you start doing things like breathing and you're like, and that feels a little bit better. And then I'm like, okay, like maybe this is more pelvic health versus a true, just Gosh. like back strain or something like that. If yeah. that makes sense. Where do they usually say they're having pain? Like, are there telltale signs of that? And then are there definite telltale signs that there's a pelvic floor thing? Like when you hear it, you're like, yeah, like that's definitely that. You know how we have certain pain patterns, things like, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's that. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's not always, you know, straight cut and straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the common areas is lower abdomen. So um, sometimes people will say like, groin area as well if they don't want to like go fully in right, and right. you know it's pelvic floor if they're like saying it hurts through like one of the canals but um a lot of my like young younger patients will talk about like lower abdomen like tightness and okay. discomfort so that's like another thing you can always be looking for like if someone's like really complaining of like lower abdomen pain your bladder is also near there so if that's not moving like it should or if they're not you know 
having bowel movements like they should, like that's going to impact the abdomen as well. So that's always like a really important area. Like if you're treating someone and they're coming in, they're saying like, oh, my, my core hurts or my stomach hurts or I feel very weak through my core. It's like, okay, is there something else that's going on here that could be contributing? Is there ever a time that you would order imaging or uh, talk to a doc about possible image and what would the imaging show if that was... Yeah, so um, it depends on what they're coming for. So I have, um, so like some patients that are like more on like the constipation side of things. Um, sometimes it's literally like we just need to see like if you're like impacted in there and need something mm -hmm. to help like clear you out. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll send them back to the doctor and be like, okay, you, you need to figure out if there's more <laughs> here than just yeah, us yeah. relaxing your pelvic floor. Um, for some patients, like I have a patient I treated in the past who had a lot of tightness along her um, abdomen. She was a post C-section patient and it was like a couple years out. And she had a lot of sensitivity along her lower abdomen. And then when I was doing some of my internal work, it just was a lot tighter than I was expecting. So she was one that I recommended going back to the doctor for an ultrasound just to see if there's adhesions in the area pulling on anything that shouldn't be pulling on. Um, for her, I don't know what she ended up doing. She went back to her doctor and then said she was doing better. So okay. <laughs> hopefully, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's good, but um, so it, it depends. But sometimes, you know, um, if patients are having more of like bladder dysfunction, um, usually they're seeing a urologist first, but, and they're doing a lot of like bladder testing, seeing, you know, if their bladder is able to completely fill, completely empty, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's usually like screened before they get to me. Do sports hernias fall along the line of what you're doing as well? I mean, it, it, is that just something completely different? I... They're ve very closely related. I mean, you're working in similar areas, similar right. muscle groups. Um, it's very close. So I, I wouldn't say if someone has a sports Are they hernia, treated the same not... way? Is, is the rehab treated the same way? Like Similar. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's, there's definitely a lot of similarities because you're working very similar muscle groups. And like I said, with pelvic health, it's so much more, I think there's a huge misconception that it's like, Oh, you just do Kegels and you're, you'll get better. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the time just doing Kegels is going to make things worse because no one really does them properly. Mm, and then yeah. if you're someone who's tight and in pain, it's just going to make everything make worse. It tight and, tight and yeah. yeah. It's doing the opposite. Gonna, gonna, yeah. I was going to say that while we're on the topic of Kegels, everyone thinks that that's the go-to, yeah. but that could actually be the problem. And then they're making the problem worse. You got to go like the opposite direction. Yeah. Could you yeah. kind of explain that a little bit? Like, yeah, of course. Um, so I think first off, that's like you said, it's a common misconception. Everyone hears, oh, there's something wrong with my pelvic floor. Just let me do some Kegels. Like do Kegels at a red light and stuff like that. Remember yeah, they're like, let's like, just yeah. do them all the time. <laughs> so first off, most people don't do them correctly mm. <laughs> or they have a lot of, so when the pelvic floor is weak, um, you tend to compensate with a lot of other muscles. So one of the things I'm looking for if I'm doing like an internal exam is I'm seeing if they can one, contract their pelvic floor correctly, but then two, if they're compensating with anything. So a lot of times you like feel like the abdomen kick in. So a lot of times when people are doing Kegels at the red light, they're just contracting their abs and not mm. actually doing what they need yeah. to. Mm. So if they are appropriate for pelvic floor str strengthening, they're not even doing it correct. But then the people who are tight or have more of like a pain type of syndrome, they actually end up making things worse because they're just contracting their abs and pulling everything tighter and not letting things properly relax. So it kind of does the opposite of what it needs to. Yeah. Interesting. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I was just thinking in my head as you were talking, I'm like, should I try to pull something up on my, my shared screen here? Or maybe what I'll do is afterwards and, and during the editing, maybe I can add up into the you know right hand corner above you. If you can get me a video of, of someone that that allows you to to shoot video and, and maybe go through some of those and we can kind of show them right over your shoulder as you just discussed that. Yeah. We can add that in, you know, before I actually put this out, you know, um on YouTube and things like yeah. that. We can kind of see a little example of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really cool. I'm just like looking over your shoulder. Yeah. There. I'm like, you know what? That would be a good spot as she's describing yeah. that. If we can yeah. put, put a, like a little video in the corner there. Yeah, we got to we got to get crafty here. You know, we got yeah. we got we got sponsors and things that we got to you know that we have to answer to. So 
you know, <laughs> well, there are we gotta get, we gotta get our advertising dollars up, you know. So yeah. anything to make it, you know, make it better. So yeah. <laughs> so we were just. Uh, so is there anything else we want to add about the younger population? Oh, um, yes. so we want to move um, into... Yeah. So biggest thing with the younger population, I think you just have to recognize they're going through so many changes, mm -hmm. um, and just be aware of that where they're at. I know that's a sen another sensitive topic, but um, it's just really crucial. Um, and you know, a lot of times, you know, they're starting to like have sex and all of that. And same thing, it's not something you're going to directly ask, but as they get close, like, as you're treating them, if you're noticing something is not fully making sense, um, that's where you could try to dive a little bit deeper with mm. them or their parent. Um, you're always able to like refer them to a pelvic health specialist. Like you can send your patients to me for a screening. Um, if it's like a female who you think would be more comfortable talking to another female um, just to get screened. And if it's not the pelvic floor, then great. You try something else. If it is the pelvic floor, we add that into their plan of care. Um, but that's some of the biggest things I would focus on with the, the younger, younger population is just all those changes they're going through. That is a good option. Um, I, you know, I kind of think about maybe some of the females that might be dealing with something, um, just maybe send them over for a screening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're always kind of on, on top of this stuff. And then, you know, um, you know, are there specific things you might maybe notice with, with, with males or is the same thing? Like, would there be something that we might yeah. see when we're exercising or working out and males might be saying like, you know, all right. Yeah. Maybe some clues or something. If they're not no. going to be so straightforward. I'm thinking also like the males in the high school, they don't really – talk yeah, as much as the female so it's hard to pull information from so they definitely could be hiding something you know yeah <laughs> um i would i mean with both populations but especially males really look at their pelvic movement <laughs> um a lot of males have a really hard time with like doing like pelvic tilts and um relaxing down the pelvic complex so if you see them tensing a lot um that can correlate with some like pelvic floor dysfunction um same thing. I mean, you can always ask like the safer questions, asking like bowel and bladder movements, because sometimes that can play a part. You know, we'll say things like, oh, like, yeah, like I, ha I have a hard time having a bowel movement or I've been constipated. Or they'll say things like, yeah, like I have some discomfort when I'm trying to, you know, urinate. Sometimes patients are more willing to say some of those, like give up some of that information. And then you can send them to a pelvic health specialist and they can dive a little bit deeper to see what's going on. But definitely with Males all ages really look at their movements, especially like pelvic, um, look at like if they're able to tilt. I always, I get like a big, um, like one of the Swiss balls and I'll have them sit on it and I'll have them do like tilts. I'll have them um, like lift their pelvis up. I'll have them do circles. You'll see it's all over the place. It's all uncoordinated. So, so, I'm like, so okay, let's get in. Uh, let, me, let me understand this a little bit better. So when they're on the stability ball, are their hips off of the ball or are they kind of rounding like around? You're sitting on, sitting on it. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So like you're centered on it and then it's, it's a tool to help them actually do the movements, but you'll see it. it's a lot of times it's very dysfunctional. <laughs> and, so they, and we don't, we just don't have the mobility in our hips to be able to do certain. Now, do you think that, that women have that because of childbirthing? They have more uh, mobility? Some do. I mean, I, some, I, I think it's not necessarily that we have it because of the birthing, but I think we're just more aware of that region mm. from things like birth right um so we're i think women are a little easier to teach some of the pelvic or exercises and movements <laughs> than males Interesting. yeah these like key things here that's kind of yeah. good yeah yeah what are you looking at mike just taking some notes here on just you know, some of these things, maybe to kind of consider and looking at how some of these athletes move, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of building out the algorithm, how we're retraining movement, you know, you know, some of the stuff that we're doing there. Um, yeah. You know, and just looking at these like spinal compensations and maybe like why, I don't know, maybe some of them are like, you know, see people like their backs are just so tight and like overworking and they could actually yeah. contributing to some other stuff or some people just can't get them to move right. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some of these other underlying things going on. Yeah. Um, what about moving more into, um, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, post-college, you know, young professional, like middle age, you know, uh, maybe with some of the lifestyle changes there, what are some things you might see there? Yeah. Are you yeah. seeing it? And I don't mean to cut that. Oh, I want to kind of add to what he's saying. 
are you seeing it more in like, you know, when you're talking about lifestyle, are you seeing it more in someone who is more sedentary, someone sitting more? Are you seeing more of, you know, when you're taking them through the health history, uh, are you finding that the people with these these uh, dysfunctions are, are people that are doing long periods of sitting? Not necessarily. It's, okay. Some, some are, but mm-hmm. um, honestly, I mean, so, I mean, we all have a pelvic floor, so all of us can have dysfunction in this area. Um, it's not necessarily correlated. It, it can be correlated with, you know, somebody who's not doing as much or somebody who's doing too much, mm. but it's across the board, all different. Okay. I have all different activity levels that I'm seeing in the clinic. Um, so for the next age group, which I would say this is probably mostly what I see. Um, I don't see as many of like the younger athletes and, um, I have some older patients, but I see mostly, you know, I have a good chunk of like in my twenties patients and then like a lot of postpartum mamas. And then I have some like middle age patients that have like incontinence or, or pain. Um, so this is probably the biggest group I see. Um, I'm trying to think, what's my train of thought again? <laughs> um, I don't remember what your question was. <laughs> it was just about the, um, more like the more like uh, signs again? after yeah after college young professional mm-hmm. age like maybe things you might see there signs and symptoms. Okay, yeah. So after college, that young group. So this age group, um, I mean, it's similar things. A lot of times, if they're not coming for directly pelvic health, you know, you start treating them, and then it's not necessarily getting better. And you're like looking at their movement. You're like, okay, maybe there's something more here. Um, the ones that are coming directly for pelvic health, um, a lot of them are pain patients. So a lot of them are more like sexually active. So they're noticing pain with that. Mm-hmm. Um, females are more often coming to me because they go to the gynecologist and get a medical exam or cannot tolerate the medical exam. So then their gynecologist will refer them. Um, males usually I think part of it is just they're nervous to talk about it. It's just not something that's widely spoken about. Um, so they put it off for years. And so it's more like chronic pain patients. So they're a little bit older by the time they come into me. Hopefully that will change as people become more aware. Um, <laughs> but so I see a lot more of the pain aspect in that younger group. Um, for my patients that are more active, I think part of it is they're doing you know, they're moving their body, they're doing all these things that they know they're supposed to do to stay healthy, then they're still having like pain and dysfunction in this area. So then they come to me and they're like, okay, how do I leave, relieve this? I can't squat without pain. I can't, you know, do my typical gym routine. What I can't run without leaking. That's another big one throughout mm. the spectrum is um, stress incontinence. So that has to do with um, they, your pelvic floor is weak, so it can't withstand pressure changes. So with stress incontinence, that's somebody who's like, oh, when I laugh, I pee myself. When I cough, I pee myself. When I sneeze. Um, you hear that like commonly with like postpartum moms, but it can happen with somebody who hasn't ever had a baby. And for those patients, they'll say things like, oh, I tried to run and I leaked my, I was leaking a little bit. Um, so just the weight of the bladder. <laughs> it's, it's more of, um, their pelvic floor is weak. So when they're doing a higher level activity, it can't, it can't stay closed like it's supposed to, like there's a sphincter that's supposed to stay closed and it doesn't. And a little bit of leakage happens or a lot, depending on how weak it is or what specific dysfunction is there. Um, How long are treatments? How long does it take to, for a typical patient to, to be relieved from this pain? So it really depends. My pain patients, I feel like take a lot longer because there's a very big um, mental component to it and psychological component. A lot of times pain is also very much wrapped in anxiety and stress, which it's like that for any part of the body. But if you have the pelvic floor and it's in pain and you can't have sex and it's embarrassing, it's so much more so. Right. So I feel like my pain patients take a lot longer because you have to work through a lot of that as well. Um, my incontinence patients, if they're able to, 
that they're compliant with the home exercise program, they get to the point where they can contract their pelvic floor correctly, then it doesn't take as long. It, you know, it's a month of teaching them and then a month of them progressing their exercises and then they can right. do a lot at home. Okay. So I would say pain is a little bit more difficult because it has a lot more to it. <laughs> Do you think that that has a lot to do with the mental piece to it, where that's just that very similar to, you know, um, like a knee surgery, right? You just, you're just associating pain there. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of more or less that. Yeah. I would say pretty much every single pelvic floor patient I see, whether it's incontinence or constipation, whatever it is, I'm always being aware of that there could be, you know, anxiety and stress around it because all mm. of these things are embarrassing and no one wants to talk about it. But a lot of times with my pain patients, you start to realize they're stressed when they're stressed and anxious, their episodes get a lot worse. So, so they're just, back. they're just piling it up because now they it's like a circle. It's a cycle. Right. So it's, their pelvic floor is in pain, which is embarrassing. It makes you right. anxious. And right. then you get, stressed and anxious about something else. So you're thinking about that. And it's this continual loop that I come in and I'm like, okay, right. let me try to relieve some of this pain, but also let's educate on other things you can do to help with the mental health aspect. So we talk a lot about like mindfulness. Um, I do a lot of deep breathing, a lot of like gentle stretches in my plan of care for like pretty much anybody just because mm -hmm. they need to like calm everything down. Right. So we right. can start to break that cycle that's happening. Are you suggesting any type of supplementation at all? Yeah, we talk, I mean, it depends on the person. Um, and I've, you know, I've even some people I've like referred to, I'm like, you need to go just take a yoga class or yeah. something. Um, you need to find something that helps calm you down and relax this, whatever it is. <laughs> um, some people, it, they benefit from going to someone like a nutritionist or a dietitian who can help them, you know, with different, you know, food plans to help with, you know, things that are flaring them up. So it just depends on the person, but yeah, there's a lot to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What about, um, like pregnancy, what are normal changes that you might have during pregnancy? And then what are things that are definitely like obviously abnormal where yeah. someone who is pregnant should get pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And then I know I asked you this question, but you say for the viewers, you know, mm -hmm. when, can someone who is pregnant start or, you know, go to pelvic yeah. floor therapy? So, yeah. um, so my personal opinion is every pregnant person should come to a pelvic floor specialist for at least a consult. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so when you're pregnant, obviously there's a baby growing in you and it's going to put a lot of pressure on that pelvic floor. So it's very common to have things such as leaking start to happen. It's really common to get pain, um, round ligament pains, one of the most, like, common areas that you get discomfort or SI joint. They get a lot of SI joint and that's just based on baby growing and putting stress on the body. Mm -hmm. um, so those are common, but definitely things that a pelvic floor therapist can help you manage. Um, like I said, I think every pregnant person should at least get a consult um, because there's a lot we can talk about, even if it's just giving some education, like, Hey, here's some great stretches to do as you near delivery. So you can mm -hmm. kind of help calm things down, prep yourself, um, to yeah. have a baby. Um, I have seen patients as early as, you know, after they see their doctor for the first time, it's like 12 weeks, all the way up. I've seen a patient a couple of days before she went into delivery. So wow. you can see it all different points. Um, I like to, you know, I make sure like their OB has cleared them for internal work if they need it. A lot of my pregnant patients don't always need the internal and some of it is just, me teaching them some gentle stretches and movements to help calm down the pain. Um, some of them, it's just, Hey, like, let me show you a couple like safe core exercises you can do just to keep everything stable and help take pressure off of where baby's sitting. Um, so it depends, but yeah, you can anywhere along that your journey of being pregnant, you can come into a pelvic floor. Um, and then definitely postpartum. I think everyone should come as well <laughs> because yeah. same thing there. I think, there's this misconception that it's normal to have things like leaking and pain and all of that. And it's common, but it shouldn't be normal. It's There's a lot you can do part. to kind of combat that. And so many women that I see come in and are like, yeah, like I've just been living 
20, 30 years with leaking because I was just told this is what happens or no one told me anything and I just assumed it's <laughs> what happens. But um, there's a lot you can do to kind of help some of those symptoms and get yourself out of that. So so basically any leaking is like not normal or just like when someone says, yeah. oh, I, I laughed or coughed or something, peed my pants. Yeah, I would say, especially like, you know, as baby grows and you're near end of pregnancy, certain things like, okay, like going to the bathroom a ton, that's going to happen. There's not much you can do. Yeah, yeah. But if you're like, I am going every single hour, it's interrupting my life. I can't manage this. Then maybe it's appropriate to see a pelvic floor specialist who can help teach you different bladder habits. Who can help with some gentle strengthening, kind of see if you can break some of that. Are we going to get them to, you know, the normal amount of five to seven that we're aiming for? No, they have a baby pressing on their bladder. Like there's only so much you can do, but if some of those pregnancy related symptoms are interfering with daily life, then yeah, you want to see somebody, but yeah, something like leaking, um, that's definitely something I would see a pelvic floor specialist for just because you want to combat it before delivery. Um, you want to, you know, get it before it gets any worse. If it's early on in the pregnancy, you want to get somebody to kind of like teach you what to do. Cause as baby gets bigger, symptoms are just going to get worse. So, um, and oh, then yeah. I would say like pain is another one that you, mm -hmm. you know, Yes, you expect as you're pregnant, it's not going to be comfortable, but if you're having pain that's inhibiting you from doing what you need to do, then you can, there's a lot you can do to calm some of that down. So see, see a pelvic floor specialist or a regular PT, they yeah. can treat a lot too. Right. <laughs> I would imagine that, you know, throughout pregnancy that some form of exercise and fitness would be beneficial. You know, there used to be this old stigma that pregnant women should not do anything, shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And the more specialists that I've been listening to are saying that that could actually be detrimental. Um, yeah, and these other things can really help for all, the, the development of the baby and also just a mm -hmm. more comfortable pregnancy, but help delivery, mm -hmm. you know, go well. Um, yeah. And I would assume be the same thing for this. You know, you tell most of your pregnant, I mean, you know, there's some extreme, you know, there's some, you know, girls that still do like CrossFit up until like, yeah. whatever, but, you know, some don't want to do that, but just some form of just weightlifting and just some cardio, they think, oh, well, you know, I got the baby, can't do anything, can't ride up stationary bike, can't do this, you know, yeah. what would you say about that? Yeah, I would definitely say, unless your doctor has specifically told you not to do movement because of some, you know, condition you have, you know, mm -hmm. there's certain things like low cervix, that kind of stuff that you're not supposed to do certain things. Yeah. Okay. But if they have not told you that, then you should definitely want to keep moving. And mm -hmm. like you said, it doesn't have to be an extreme. You don't have to go run a marathon, right. <laughs> but um, just keep your body moving is so important for your mental health. You want to, you know, you're supplying another human being. So for your heart health mm -hmm. um, and just general muscle activation. So you don't go, I mean, we all know this in this world that if you don't use it, you lose it. So if you're not using it for nine months and growing another human, you're definitely going to be weak and it's going to just lead to possible dysfunction postpartum, mm -hmm. you know, new baby at home. So you don't want that. So right, <laughs> just yeah, prepping right. your yeah. body as much as possible is super important. <laughs> yeah, that is. Yeah. Do you feel like we've, uh, we've, we've gotten everything there or do you feel like, do you want to add to any of that, Nicole? Like, what do you? Yeah, I feel like we hit a lot of good stuff. I think, like I said, I think this is a topic that has a lot of misconception around it, like we've already said. And I like it, a lot of people think, oh, you just do a Kegel and you're good to go, which right. is not true. <laughs> um, I think it's something that people are starting to talk more about, which is really good. Um, I yeah, I mean, I certainly don't remember awareness. hearing anything about this <laughs> five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I really yeah don't definitely remember. not. Yeah. So I think it's, just something we definitely need to keep talking about because a lot of my patients, when they get to me, they could have come a lot sooner. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just taken a while. Luckily, more doctors are talking about it and referring. There's more resources out there. So if you Google your pelvic floor or Kegel, there's things out there that will like start pointing you towards a pelvic floor therapist, which is really good. But yeah, I mean, I think if anyone's dealing with any of this, it's super important to at least you know, reach out, get a consult, talk to someone who specializes in it, even if you can't get into the clinic, because I've had patients call and they're like, I'm dealing with this. I'm like, okay, they come in, I'll, I'll screen you, see if yep. it's needed. And sometimes they only need one or two visits. It's me just tweaking what they're already doing at home. And yeah. sometimes they need a full plan of care. But if it's something as simple as you come in and me just teaching you how to activate your pelvic floor and you add that into your normal exercise routine, like 
doesn't take long and it helps a lot. So <laughs> how, how would someone get a hold of you? What would, what would be the best way to, for them to find you? So for me, um, they can call my clinic. My patient coordinator is amazing. So she knows when someone's calling for a pelvic floor, if I'm not in the clinic, she like texts me right away. <laughs> it's like, Hey, um, this person, we got one, we got one. <laughs> and then, um, I also through my email. So I give that out to all my patients as well. So if they have like questions or need anything outside of the sessions, they can email me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any social media presence? Don't have much now. Okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, what would be a good website? www.ivrehab. Yeah. So I'm the Horsham South location. Okay. Um, so if someone looks that up, they'll find us. I will say Ivy's really good. Like if you call any of the Ivy's, they, they should know where all of us pelvic floor specialists are at. Cause we're gotcha. spread out through the region and the company. So if they call a clinic and they're like, Oh, we don't have it here. They should be able to point them towards wherever we're at gotcha. um, within the company. Yeah. Okay. But I'm in Horsham South. So gotcha. <laughs> would, anyone's looking for me specifically. <laughs> Yeah, that's the Ivy Rehab that's right next to the Horsham Athletic Center mm -hmm. off Horsham Road. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in my clinic in Warminster, I have uh, Nicole's bio up. So anyone could go there and check in. That will direct there, the phone number, hours, all that stuff. So someone might see that and might have to say anything. They got to check this out. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Mike, got any uh, final thoughts there? No, I mean, this was great. I'm glad we got this topic covered. I've wanted to do this for a while. Yeah. We got a little yep. behind with like holidays and all that stuff. But this is important <laughs> because, yeah, you know, um, this ties into it. Uh, and this is not only beneficial for, you know, our population that we specialize in, but our entire general population. Mm -hmm. This is something that other clinicians can use. And we can share this around. This is just information. It still amazes me that now in, we're in a, an age of information is available but you have to kind of find out where the good information is because mm -hmm. everybody has a voice, everybody yeah. has a platform. So you got to kind of like sift through now what's good. So I always say the word of mouth or, or things like this, like someone recommends a podcast or an individual, you know, here's some good information. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to direct all the information, funnel it in, and then be able to, uh, you know, siphon it to people appropriately so they could find it. Because, yeah, there's just so much stuff out there and people don't know what's right, you know, what's wrong um that's just you know this is kind of just the way things are now so if we could kind of help get some clarity i think that'll make things less confusing and it can save people a lot of time i mean still there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time in some healthcare situation whether it's pt or something else just spinning wheels paying money and we're not, we're not better you know or they're just living their life just adapting and just survival mode like thinking this is okay <laughs> it's not so Hopefully this will be able to help a lot of people. Amen to that. Yeah. I mean, this was, this was cool. This was a definite learning lesson for me. Like I said, um, you know, other than just my older son talking about this a little bit, I, as soon as I hear pelvic health, I'm thinking, you know, female issue. Um, okay. Yes. It's important to us, you know, because that's our population, but uh, I didn't realize that there was so much of that, you know, the males can be uh, affected by that. So um, great stuff, Nicole. Appreciate it. Mike, where can they find you? Uh, Mike St. George on LinkedIn. Uh, we're going to be making a, a clinic uh, Instagram page, so we'll stay tuned for that. We'll try to okay. get that up so we okay. can start posting a lot of this stuff there. Um, you know, really a lot of the stuff I'm putting up on, on, on LinkedIn. You can see a lot of things we're doing in the clinic, a lot of the uh, this, all the podcasts as well. So it's real find me mostly with this type of stuff. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you're – I, we talked about this earlier today. I was on a call with you. Uh, your LinkedIn page is phenomenal. The, the videos and the, the voiceover to explain what you're doing is nothing like I've seen any physical therapist do. <laughs> I swear. There's, well, Nicole there's nobody on doing there doing any of that. Too. You know? and, yeah. and and not everybody wants to be on camera. You know, sometimes right. you mess up. And then, you know, sometimes you could just have, you know, an aide or someone video what you're doing and get mm -hmm. some good angles and stuff as long as they sign the consent. And then you just do a voiceover after. So you get it down. And sometimes I got to, you know, you do a couple takes until you say how you wanted to explain it. And then make sure the captions come up right. Cause sometimes AI is a little stupid, and then, you know, and then it's great. And then people could just see that and follow through what you're doing yeah. and be like, that yeah. is awesome. You know, yeah. so yeah. They're doing a great job with that. 
Appreciate okay, it. yeah, you can find me at Coach underscore Haas on Instagram, Coach Haas on Facebook, Coach Haas podcast on YouTube. <laughs> Uh, you just put in Coach Haas, H-O-S, and, and you'll probably find me somewhere on some platform. Um, but, again, this was a, a, another great show. We got another good one tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. This was the week of the females. So, uh, yeah. yeah, we have Nicole today. We have Erica tomorrow. So um, this is a, a, a great week of some shows. And, Nicole, again, thank you for your time. You guys have a great night. And uh, till the next one. Absolutely. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, thank you. Have a good night. See ya.